Okay, good morning. Uh, let's take a seat. Okay, so this is the uh, last lecture of the course. Uh, so we're getting ready to you know, take a break for the holidays, for Christmas. Um, so today what we'll do is uh, we will... Um, Thank you. Okay, so what we do today is um, just conclude the, the course. Uh, we, what we'll do is we will cover, um, um, you know, something that we started last time at the end of last time. So we'll do it um, kind of like a little bit, maybe quickly, quickly um, discuss a little bit this idea of notion of robustness to uncertainty and how you can make sure that uh, your design is robust. And then we will talk about what I would call implementation issues. Uh, that is, we have talked about how you design a controller, right? And the way that we design controllers is by writing down some transfer function, right? So we have a PID, uh, or maybe we had a lead compensator, a lag compensator, a lead lag. So these are all transfer functions, right? So these are functions in the variable S. How do we actually implement those compensators, okay? So this is will be the last topic. Okay, so, um, you know, I will go quickly through this because, you know, we already talked about it, uh, you know, last time. Uh, remember, so everything that we have done in the class uh, is based on getting a model, um, you know, for the system and designing a controller for that model, okay? Now, something that you should always keep in mind is that no matter how much time you spend on getting your model, the model is only a model, it's not reality, okay? So what you have to do is make sure that your control design works not only for the model, but for the true system. Problem is that you do not know the true system, okay? I hope that the, you know, this, this notion is, is clear, okay? Right, so why, you know, why is it not always the case that your, system, your model is correct. First of all, you know, there may be some complex physical phenomena that you may not be able to capture or you may not want to capture, okay? So, for example, when you do, um, you know, our friends, the fluid dynamicists, they like to have very sophisticated simulations of the airflow around an airplane. But those simulations take days to run. Now, when you're flying an airplane in real time, you really have days to model, you know, the airflow about, you know, every aerodynamic surface. No way, right? So you need something that is much simpler, right? So uh, that can run in real time, right? So even though you could potentially model the airflow around all the uh, airplane, you choose not to do that, okay? Also, um, Running an experiment to get some experimental validation of a model, maybe something that is affected by noise in the sensors or, you know, whatever other variations in your parameters, um, uh, disturbances in the environment that may not give you the, the good model, okay? So the, the, the basic idea is this one, right? So what, what you do is the following. So let's say that you have a certain model, P. Okay. Um, you know that your nominal model is not the real model. The real model is somewhere in this pink set. Let's say this is the real system. Problem is you don't know what it is. Okay. However, typically what you can say is that, well, I don't know where my real model is, but I know that will be within some distance in some appropriate metric from my nominal model, okay? Typically, the way that you express this distance is something that is conservative in the sense that you try to be um, so better safe than sorry, right? So you say, okay, so this will be within, um, you know, within this circle, within this ball, right, even though your uncertainty may actually be smaller as you see in this, in this pin set, okay? So then the idea is that you want to make sure that you design a controller that works not only for this one, 
but for all systems in the blue bar, which in particular will include the real system, even though you don't know it. Okay? So this is the idea of robustness. Okay. How do you do it? Well, okay, so uh, we we'll talked about it last time. So essentially what to say is um, write down your nominal system, right? And then um, essentially represent your, um, let, let me write it here. Um, essentially what you say is that, okay, so this is my nominal transfer function, and then you say that, well, this is a ball of radius delta, okay? In some, um, you know, in some metric, right? In particular, what you would say is that, okay, so delta is something that you want to change between zero and one, okay? So if this distance is not, is not exactly one, what you would say is just, you know, multiply by some W, okay, which is some weight. So essentially something that gets you the scaling, okay? So W is the actual radius of this ball, and delta is something that changes between zero and one, okay? Just a way of scaling things. Okay, okay so, um, so what we would say is here, so what we have is some transfer function delta. What we know is that the magnitude of this delta is bounded by one, okay? So think of it as the, as you know, how much, um, how far away you're going, you're going from the nominal model while staying within that circle, okay? And then this W, in this case I'm calling W2, this W is really the, the actual scale of that, of the distance, of the size of that ball, okay? In general, what we would say is that this weight is actually a frequency of, is, is a function of the frequency, okay? This is just to say that you may know your model very well at certain frequencies and very poorly at some other frequencies, okay? So, um, you know, again, so we can go to this one, right? So, in this case, let's say that you have a certain system and you run an experiment where you say, okay, so let's try um, let's input a sinusoid of frequency 0 0.1 radians per second, and then what I get is a sinusoid that is, you know, smaller by uh, negative 10 dB than the input sinusoid, right? And has a phase of, let's say, negative 75 degrees or whatever this number is, okay? Then you repeat the experiment at a bunch of other frequencies, right? And then you can build this, this curve, okay? Now, this curve is something that you can imagine, you can think of as a body plot, right? The body plot that is actually constructed empirically from the experiment, okay? But now, as you can see, this body plot is not the sequence of, you know, straight lines that we, that we have, that, you know, that you do when you do your exercises and then, uh, your control design, right? So what you see is that it's much more messy. Okay. On the other hand, what we can say is that, well, you know what? Maybe I can approximate this with something that looks like, you know, something like that, okay? But then I would say, but then I recognize that, well, there is a discrepancy between that black line and what I actually see in the experiments, right? You know, I can think of it something like that, okay? Do you see where W2 W or W uh, uh, is in this figure? So this is a logarithmic plot, right? So when I add or su subtract something, what is it that I'm doing to the function? So if I, if I go from this point to this point that is, say, uh, 
5 dBs or whatever number higher, what is the value of the function? How does the value of the function change? If I add 5 dB. Anybody? 6 dB. 6 dB is about 2, right? Okay. So if I add 6 dB, it means that I'm taking that function and multiplying by 2. Okay. If I subtract 6 dB, what am I doing? to the value of the function. I'm dividing it by two. Okay? Is it clear? So if I take the body plot and I imagine that I have a function that is actually, I take as my nominal model the, you know, essentially the average of my empirical constant function. Okay? And then I take the deviations Right? So essentially what I'm doing is I'm looking at the nominal model, which is the geometric mean of all the, all the, of the magnitude of the frequency response. And then I'm multiplying, multiplying and dividing by some number. Okay? And that number is, yes, <laughs> what is this distance here? This is exactly W2. At j omega. Okay. okay. And delta just tells me how far along that along that line uh, my actual system is. Okay. So when you see something like that, then how do you write it down? You know, in terms of formulas, this is exactly this idea of multiplicative uh, uncertainty. Okay. So as, as we said, every time you add or subtract something on the logarithmic plot, you're multiplying or dividing the function by some number, okay? And this is how you can write it. So essentially what we are saying is that my true but unknown model is P tilde. And this is something that I can obtain by taking my nominal model and multiplying by one plus W2 delta, right, which is our measure of the uncertainty, okay? You can, do, you can do the algebra, and then what you see is that essentially the ratio between the nominal model, the true model, and the nominal model minus one, so essentially how far that ratio is from the unity, that's exactly the W2, okay? And as I said, as we said before, um, you know, this multiplicative uncertainty is useful when you are trying to model something that, for which you don't know the gain exactly, right? So you don't know the gain, um, um, uh, the magnitude body plot, okay, exactly, of your, of your transfer function, okay? Uh, by the way, what happens to the phase? Notice that when we say that delta is something that, you know, delta is something that is in, uh, actually W2 delta is something that is bounded in magnitude, but we don't know the phase. Actually, the phase can be kind of like arbitrarily off, okay? okay. Now, something else that you may want to notice is, for what frequency ranges do you think that your model will be better? And for what frequency ranges your model will be, your uncertainty will be bigger. Actually, kind of like I didn't draw that well here. You see that for low frequencies, typically your uncertainty is very small. Do you have an idea why that is? Okay, okay that, that's a good point, right? So typically, um, yeah, it is true that your transfer function is always something that decays, goes to zero as the frequency increases, right? So if you have a certain error on your sensors, it's easier to measure something that is big rather than something that is very small, right? Uh, there is also another effect, 
why do you think that the low frequencies, it's easier to make measurements? How would you measure your zero frequency uh, gain? Any idea? What is the signal at frequency zero? Yeah? It's a step, right? So you just give a constant reference, right? Or a constant input, and you see what happens, right? Your system, assuming it is stable, you know, if you give a constant reference, then your system will eventually go to a constant, right? This constant will be affected by noise and everything else, but you can measure that almost constant for a very long time and take the average, right? So that's actually a measurement that is easy to, to make, right? Whereas when you move to higher frequencies, and actually here, I, you know, I you know, should have drawn this differently, right? So you see that you know, this, this large peak, right? So um, the, the average should have been something like that, okay? So you see that, you know, as you are going to a higher frequencies, then, of course, the, the, you know, the quantities that you're trying to measure are smaller, and they're changing very rapidly, okay? And typically in the high frequency range is where you also get the noise in the sensors. So when you go to higher and higher frequencies, you have no idea what you're measuring. Is that noise... Is that the system? These are small quantities. I have no idea, right? So typically, your uncertainty is very large at high frequencies and is very small at low frequencies, okay? You also see it here in the phase. Look at what happens to the phase. So here is kind of, you know, I think that you can believe that, you know, um, uh, if you draw a curve that approximates this phase curve, you know, in this range, would be a pretty good model. But look at what happens at high frequencies. It just gets completely off, okay? And again, this is a, this idea that your, uh, um, your uncertainty gets bigger at high frequencies, okay? So you have this uncertainty model, okay? Now, what do you do with it? Okay, so this is how you write it as a block diagram, if you want to do that, okay? So here you have your, uh, your nominal plant, this whole thing will be your real plant, right? And then you model the real plant as a nominal plant plus this multiplicative uncertainty, okay? This is your control system. Now, what you want to do is make sure that your, um, um, your feedback control loop is stable, not only for this transfer function, right? but for the transfer function affected by this uncertainty. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, I mean, clearly, in order to make sure that uh, your closed loop is stable given the uncertainty, it must be stable at least for the nominal model, right? If your design is not stable for the nominal model, then you know, there is a problem in your design, clearly, okay? So first we will make the assumption that this transfer function here is stable, okay? Then um, what we can do is, okay, so we can write the real transfer function. This is the transfer function that we do not know, okay? is given by this L, the nominal transfer function, plus this other term that includes the effect of the uncertainty, okay? Now, we do not know what delta of j omega is, but we know that it is bounded by one, okay? So... Given that, what we can say is that if we just take the magnitude of the difference between the true but unknown model minus the nominal transfer function, this must be equal to this quantity here. Since the magnitude of delta is bounded by one, then we can just simplify it to that, okay? And how do we make sure that um, um, that the closed loop system with the true transfer function is actually stable. What we want to make sure of is that if we draw the Nyquist plot of the true transfer function, which we do not know, 
what you have is that you have you know the, this true plot of the or you know the true Nyquist plot does not touch the minus one point. Okay, so the condition that we will have is that we would like the true transfer function uh, to be farther away from the minus one point than this quantity here. Okay, so we can see it in this plot, right? So essentially what you do is, this is L, this is my nominal transfer function, okay? I do not know where the real transfer function is, okay? Right, so the true transfer function could be, you know, something, you know, whatever. Could be something like that, okay? I don't know, okay? But I do know that at any frequency, for example, at this frequency here, the true transfer function will be within this circle, okay? At this point, maybe within this circle. This point may be within this circle, okay? Okay? So, essentially the way it works is that you know, something like that. So essentially the way it works is that you will draw the, the nominal transfer function, okay? Then what you can do is for, ev for every value of the frequency, you can draw this circle, which has a radius W2 of J omega, okay? Um, and then you want to make sure that the envelope of all these circles does not touch the minus one point, okay? And that's how you actually check using Nyquist the robust stability of your closed loop design, okay? So you see the point? So it's not only sufficient to check that your Nyquist plot does not intersect, does not in, encircle the minus one point. You want to make sure that also the envelope of this transfer function given the uncertainty does not touch the minus one point, okay? And this is your test for robust stability, okay? Um, right, so you know, I hope it's clear that you know, this is the same as saying, um, this is the distance of, so this is actually equal to the magnitude of L of J omega minus the minus one point, right? So this is the distance of L of J omega from the minus one point. Okay. okay, questions on this? And you see, this is, this is when we talk about the phase margin and the gain margin, right? You see that this is, in a sense, is a, uh, is a measure of how far away my minus one point uh, or actually, how far away my loop transfer function is from the minus one point, okay? So clearly the, the, the gain margin is measuring this distance here. The phase margin is measuring the angle, kind of like here, okay? So the phase margin and the gain margin are only some estimates of how far you are from the minus one point. Really what we should do is look at the size of these circles. Okay. Okay. Questions on this? Good. Okay, so then I would like to move on to the uh, next and last topic. And this is the, how you actually implement these controllers on a physical device, okay? On a computer, for example, on your Seesaw uh, microcontroller, okay? <laughs> So now at this point, at least in principle, you know how to design a, uh, a control system, right? So we have gone through the steps, you've done a number of exercises, you will do more, you will be more comfortable with the whole process, right? But at least in principle, we know how to go about designing these compensators and you know, for single input, single output uh, linear systems. And typically what you have is, um, you know, a compensator takes the form of a transfer function, right? Because we always write this compensator as something that some 
proportional gain times, you know, plus a derivative gain times s, plus an integral gain times 1 over s, or maybe a ratio of a first order term with a zero on the numerator and a first order term with a pole at the denominator, right? You know, things like that. Okay. So in general, what you write is, you know, what you do is you write your compensator as some form of rational transfer function. Okay? Now, fine. So you're done with your design. Now what do you do with it? Right? So how do you convert this thing into something physical, something that you can touch, and more than that, something that can touch your system, right? Questions? Or, okay, just some buzz, random buzz. Okay. okay, so what was done in the past is that you can actually, you know, our friends in the... Uh, Electrical engineering department, you know, they spend a lot of time, or they used to spend a lot of time, into building circuits that can actually, that from the point of view of a physical electrical system, analog electrical system, would have exactly the transfer function that we need, okay? You just put enough capacitors, resistors, inductors in the right place, and then you can realize such transfer functions, okay? So this was, was what was done in the old days. Now, nobody does that anymore, okay? So what you do today is you can buy microcontrollers, you know, some small microprocessors for very cheap, a few dollars, right, or even less, okay? And what you do is you can program these microcontrollers to implement a system that has this transfer function or something that is very close to this transfer function, okay? And that's something that is, you know, if you want to change a parameter in your analog circuit, well, you need to rip off that capacitor, right, and then soldier in another capacitor, right, or another inductance or something. If you want to change some parameter in your microcontroller, you just program it again and flash it, okay, and that's done, okay? So this is you know, what, what, what you do these days. So how do you do it? Now, you may remember at some point earlier in the class, what we talk about is, so we have a state-space model, how do we convert that to a transfer function, okay? Because that's something, so we use the transfer function, the transfer function model is easier to use for the kind of tools that we have explored in this class, okay? But then I also did something else, that is, given a transfer function, how do you come up with a state-space model for that transfer function? And you may ask, you know, why the heck do I need that, right? So usually the process is from the state model to the transfer function. The reason why I covered that part, you know, that, you know, how do you realize the transfer function is exactly because that's what we need when we want to implement one of these controllers uh, on, a, on a computer, okay? So, remember that given a transfer function written in, or, yeah, the transfer function written in this form, notice that what I'm doing is the following. I want to have this fraction is actually a, strictly proper transfer function, uh, sorry, strictly proper rational function. Strictly proper means that the degree of the numerator is strictly less than the degree of the denominator, okay? Um, but then I also have this term, K, okay? okay? Which, you know, clearly this term is, is just proper, right? Um, if you do the algebra, what you will see is that if I multiply you know, if I just bring everything to a common fraction and I have a k that is non-zero, k will go and multiply the higher, the highest order term, right? So essentially, um, this transfer function here is a transfer function that is proper, which I write as a gain plus a strictly proper uh, rational function. Okay, is it clear? Why do I do that? Because if I have something like that, then what I see is that the D matrix in my state space model is actually the same as this gain. Okay, so some of you were asking me, why do we get in certain systems we have, we make the assumption that D is zero, why in some, some other times D is not zero? <laughs> okay, so typically whenever you have a transfer function that is proper, but not strictly proper, for example, like a gain, 
that's what becomes your D. Okay? Typically, all physical systems that you find in nature, so not your microcontroller, okay? So all physical systems, they actually are strictly proper, so they will not have this term K, and in those cases, the D term will be zero. Okay, so this is typically um, a physical system. Okay, given that, if you remember what we did back then, what we know is that given this transfer function, I can write a state space model where the A matrix is given by a matrix that has on the bottom row all the coefficients of the denominator with a negative sign. So you start with negative A naught, negative A1, blah, 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 all the way to, um, oops, this should have been at this, at this position here, okay? So this should be here. Okay, so you have you know, all the coefficients of the denominator on the bottom line, on the bottom row. Then you have all zeros, and then you have ones on the upper diagonal. Okay, so just one above and, and, and right of the diagonal. Okay? B matrix has all zeros and the one at the bottom. C matrix has the coefficients of the numerator. Okay? D matrix has the uh, has this game. Okay. Now, the your controller is a dynamical system, right? What is the input to the controller, the compensator? What goes inside your controller? What does your controller take as an input? It's actually the error, right? So remember what the what the feedback loop looks like, right? So typically here, what you have this is the error, right? And this is the control input. Okay, everybody okay with this? So what is the input to the compensator? The input to the compensator is actually what we call the error, and the output of the compensator is what we call the input. So I know it can be a little bit confusing, right? <laughs> but that's what the controller does, right? So the compensator does, you know, takes an error, does some computation, and decides what the control input should be. Everybody okay with that? Not so much. <laughs> Okay, so keep in mind that, okay? So the, the input to the, to, the, you know, to the controller is the error, the output of the controller is what we call, is the input to the plant, right? You, okay? So then once we have that realization, actually implementing that controller is very simple, okay? What you do is the following. You write a short program, this is like a pseudocode, but you know, if you write it in C or in MATLAB or anything else, it will be just a handful of lines, really, okay? So what you do is you initialize the state, say, to zero, okay? So if your system is stable, does it really, we know that the initial conditions don't really matter, so just initialize it to zero. I mean, you can initialize to any other value, but why? So <laughs> typically you initialize it to zero, okay? Let's choose dt, this is some small time interval, okay? So this is how, how often this loop will be repeated, okay? So this depends on how fast your microcontroller is. So then what you will do is just repeat this loop forever, okay? Just keep doing this, okay? Until the battery runs out or you push the off button on your controller or something, okay? Just keep doing this forever. What you do is you read the reference value. This is the command of the user. Okay, so this is, you know, if you have like a steering wheel or a gas pedal or a, you know, thermostat, right, setting, this is the reference value. Read the measured output value Y, okay? So then what you do is then compute the error. This is just R minus Y. Okay. Right? 
Then what I will do is I would really like to do the following, right? So I know that x dot is equal to ax plus bu. Okay, but my computer doesn't know how to compute derivatives. So what I will do is I will approximate this derivative by x at time, say, t plus dt minus x at time t over dt. Okay? This is equal to a x of t plus b. Um, sorry, remember that the input in this case is e, okay? Plus b e of t. Right? Everybody okay with that? Okay. So what this means is that my x at time t plus dt will be given by approximately, I know this is also an approximation, right? So this is an approximation of the, of the derivative. So this would be the derivative if I took the limit with dt goes to zero, okay? If dt is some finite value, not zero, this is just an approximation, okay? And then how do I approximate this? This is given by, just do the algebra. This is x of t plus a x of t plus b, uh, sorry, e of t, the whole thing multiplied by dt, okay? Okay, so essentially what we are doing is we are implementing on our microcontroller a dynamical system that approximates the dynamical system that has the transfer function that I want, okay, the, of my compensator, okay? So, yeah, so I compute the new value of the state, then given the new value of the state, I just multiply it by C, add D times the input to the controller, and then what it generates is the output of the controller, which is actually my, what I had to send to the plant as an input, which is U, okay? And then just send this command, write this command U to your actuators. And just keep repeating that, okay? So what does this look like? For example, for a few examples. So for a proportional controller, what are the A, B, C, D matrices? Any idea? Um, almost, just a subtlety. Um, what do you mean by the others are zero? Maybe they are diagonal. Um, so let, let's start from you know the part that you got right. Okay, so I, I think that you, you had the right intuition. Um, so essentially, for proportional control, then what you have is that d is equal to k. Okay, what are a, b, uh, and c? What is the dimension of the state? What is the order of the denominator? <laughs> Anybody? How many poles, how many poles does this transfer function have? Zero. So what is the dimension of your state? Zero. What is the dimension of your A, B, and C? matrices, zero, right? So it's not that the matrix is zero, it's that the, the matrix is zero dimension does not exist, okay? <laughs> okay, so then, yeah, in this case, you know, just A, B, and C are, you know, just nothing, okay? So you only have D, okay? So then what you will do is, you know, in, in your for loop, uh, what, what is it that you do? Um, essentially what you set is, well, um, you know, so what you read is, um, well, I mean, you just say, you know, so loop, then u is equal to k times e, and then you write u, and then you just keep doing that, okay? okay. 
But what happens in the case of PI control? So now what we have is KP plus KI through S. So your matrix A is what? What is on the bottom line of that of that matrix? So first of all, what is the dimension of the matrix A? How many poles do we have? How many? Sure. Look at the transfer function. This is the transfer function. And this is the transfer function now, right? So how many poles do we have? One, okay? So what is the dimension of the matrix A? It's a one by one matrix, right? What goes on the bottom row of that matrix? It's negative, the coefficients of, the, of all the entries at the denominator, right? Starting from the order zero term. What is the coefficient of the order zero term? Zero. So your matrix A is zero. Your matrix B will be one, right? Because we have all zeros, but the, the last number, the bottom number, which is one. Right. Uh, what is C? That is actually the coefficients of your numerator, right? Ki. What is D? Kp. Okay, so what is your loop at this point? So the new value of X will be the old value of X plus what? A that multiplies the old value. A is zero, so we can forget it plus B that multiplies the error, right? And the whole thing multiplied by DT. So this will be plus T times DT, okay? Then how do I compute Y? Y will be given by, uh, uh, what is it? KP, um, uh, sorry, KIX plus KP. E, uh, sorry, this is not why this is you. Ah, anyway. ah. Um. Okay. And this is what you run in your microcontroller. So very simple, right? So <laughs> many years ago, one of the students in my classes, um, in my class, you know, ask me, so where do I buy an integrator, right? So integrators are great, but you know, how do I get one? This is how you get one, okay? This is exactly the kind of control loop that generates, that implements an integrator, okay? You see is essentially two lines of code, okay? Let's take a break, we'll keep going you know, after you know, 15 minutes. We are almost done. Come on, uh, just <laughs> take a seat. Right. So, um, okay. So, what happens in the case in which I have this, uh, like, a, like a lead or a lag controller, a lead or a lag compensator? How would you go about it? 
Well, first of all, you see that the way that I wrote this transfer function, this is a proper but not strictly proper transfer function, right? So how do I transform it into a gain plus a strictly proper transfer function? Any idea? What if I wrote something like that? Uh, so this is equal to K that multiplies S plus Z minus Z plus P over S plus Z. Can I do that? Loose kosher, right? <laughs> right? But then I can separate this, this fraction into so this would be k plus p minus z over s plus z, right? Okay. So now I've written this as a as a gain plus a strictly proper transfer function. Okay. Now, how do I implement this this compensator on a on my microcontroller? What is a or what is d? Okay, so let's start from the easy part. D will be what? Yeah. Oh, uh, I think I, I know what yours. I forgot the K. Okay. Um, okay, so what is D? This is just K, right? What is A? What is the dimension of A? How many poles do I have? Come on. It's not the different from the previous one. Zero poles? No, are you sure? What is A? So the dimension of A is one, right? Because we have one pole. What goes on the bottom row of the A matrix? Negative the coefficients of the denominator. Right? Ooh, um, yeah, I don't know why I, I call it P and Z this way, but anyway. Um, so what, what, is, what is A? Is the coefficient of the denominator starting from the zero order term, right? So A would actually be minus Z, right? What is B? B is equal to one. What is C? Will be K that multiplies P minus Z. Okay. So how do I write my loop? X will be given by um, X plus uh, minus Z times X plus E times dt, right? And um, u will be given by k that multiplies p minus z x plus k t. Okay? Sounds good? This is how you implement all of your controllers that you can design in this course in reality, okay? This is what is done on your seesaw. Okay. okay, good. Now, uh, something a little bit more complicated is what if we have a known proper transfer function? As we know, uh, you cannot really implement a known proper transfer function, right? But unfortunately, PIDs, for example, the derivative term, when, whenever you use a, 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 a you know a PID controller, you're actually cheating because the derivative term you cannot actually implement in reality. Okay. So what we do is we will have to approximate the you know that that derivative of the error. Okay. And the way you do it is 
you just keep track of what the previous error was right, at the previous time step, and then you try to approximate the derivative, how much this, uh, this derivative changes uh, you know, over time. And uh, yeah, and essentially this is what, what you do. So you, as before, you take the reference value, take the output value, compute the error, update the state like that. Then your output will be, um, you know, the output as before, plus the derivative gain multiplied the derivative of the error. How do I compute, how do I approximate the derivative of the error? What I will do is take the current error minus the old error divided by the t. That is an approximation of my derivative. Okay? Send the command, and then you store the, you know, now the new error becomes the old error, right? And then you keep running this loop. Okay? So as you can see, this is not the derivative, right? So this is just an approximation of the derivative. That's why. Uh, and in particular, this is the derivative that is taken with respect to the past, right? And that's why, you know, you're actually not cheating. So that's why you can actually, so this is an approximation that you can realize physically because you're not looking into the future, which you don't know, but you're looking at the derivative as approximated from the past behavior of the error. Okay? And that's how you do it. Okay? So... Now the point is, how do you choose the sampling time? Okay, so typically what you do is, so you have this loop that keeps running, okay? Of course, every time you execute this loop will take some time on your computer, okay? Let's say this dt, okay? What happens to the input to the plant during this time? Typically what people do is, you compute a value and then you hold that value constant up to the time where you compute a new value of the input, okay? So this is something that's called the zero order hold, okay? So essentially what, what happens is that, say, um, so let's say that you are trying to, you know, really what you would like to have is, say this is time, and this is you, what you really like to have is a function like that. What you're implementing is actually a function like that. So essentially, you compute a new value every, every delta t, right? And then you hold it for that delta t, okay? So as you can imagine, the, um, the effect of this essentially sampling and holding, right, or computing the value and holding that, that value for some finite time is kind of equivalent to taking the, my um, you know, original function and kind of delaying it by how much? By approximately my delta t divided by two, okay? You see, you see what is happening here? It's kind of like it's a, as if I shifted everything by my delta t, right? But you know, if I look at the averages, we are shifting everything by dt over 2. So, remember when we were talking about time delays? This is how time delays affect your phase margin, okay? So now you have your microcontroller that is running. The microcontroller will have some delay just due to the computation, okay? This delay is kind of effectively dt over 2, okay? And now what you have to do is, okay, let's try to understand how much does a time delay of dt over two affect my system, okay? And you remember that we actually have a formula that gives me what is the phase delay due to a time delay, right? The, fa the phase lag due to a time delay. If that phase lag reduces your phase margin by too much, then you start running into trouble, right? If that, if, that, if that phase lag is very small with respect to your, your phase margin, then you don't care, right? So anyway, so uh, essentially what you have to do is look at if two over dt is much higher than the bandwidth of the system, so essentially your computer is so much faster than, yeah. Um, 
Um, just eyeballing this figure or, you know, just do it, you know, like a simpler one, okay? So let's say that you're trying to approximate just this function, just uh, say u is equal to t, okay? And you do that by this, um, you know, step function, right? So every dt, <coughs> you sample and hold, okay? Now, take the average of this step function. What does it look like? The average of that is this, right? How much is that is the red line delayed with respect to the black line? Is dt over two, okay? You, you get the point? Okay. So it would be dt if I were to look at, you know, just a, a line that is here, right? But this is not how we approximate. <laughs> The, the, the step function, okay. Okay, clear? Okay. So anyway, so essentially if the, um, if you're, you know, if this time delay or, you know, it's inverse is, is, um, um, is sufficiently high with respect to the bandwidth of your system. So your microcontroller runs at a few kilohertz, right? And then you're controlling a car you know, a car is something that humans drive, right? So how do you think that the, what are the frequencies at which your car will respond? Will be a few hertz, right? Because otherwise a human will not be able to, you know, interface with it, okay? So then if, you're, if your microcontroller runs at a few kilohertz, then you don't care, you know, your controller is clearly so much faster than your, than your system, okay? But, you know, there may be cases in which your controller is low and your, your plant is fast where you actually may get into trouble, okay? Um, if, so, if you're starting to get into the region where your controller may introduce too much of a phase delay, phase lag, then either you buy a faster computer, okay, or you control, you change your control design to make the phase margin bigger, or if, you know, if all these fail, you know, there are actually design techniques that are actually directly in the discrete time domain that may allow you to design, you know, to have a better design, but this is not something that we do in this class, okay? So this is an example, right? So here I have a system, right? I design my compensator and, you know, when I do everything in MATLAB, MATLAB tells me that, okay, so the response will be this continuous line. But now I want to implement it on a real system. So what I have to do is implement it on a microcontroller, okay? And let's say I choose a very, you know, a very fast uh, DT, a very fast microcontroller. Here, fast needs to be understood in terms of what is the time constant of the system, right? So what is the bandwidth of the system, okay? If I choose DT is equal to 0.1, what you see, what you get is, actually, you cannot even see it. Um, there is actually a red line, a reddish line that tracks the black line very closely, okay? So you see that if I choose dt to be 0 0.1, my response will be almost exactly the one that I would expect from, a con from the continuous model, okay? But then as I make the dt, you know, bigger and bigger, meaning that I make my, my microcontroller slower and slower, what you start seeing is that, okay, so we have this yell yellowish line it kind of like it deviates a little bit from the ideal behavior, but it's still okay. Uh, the purple line that starts deviating more and more, the green line, you start to see that, you know, it deviates a lot more, right? And as you can see, as I make my con microcontrollers lower and slower, what you see is that the oscillations increase. What does the fact that oscillations increase tell you? <laughs> What can you say about the damping ratio, for example, of my, of my, of my system? Damping ratio is going to zero, right? So my closed loop poles are actually getting closer and closer to the imaginary axis, okay? So you see that I'm oscillating more and more. It means that the system is getting closer and closer to instability. I'm reducing my phase margin, okay? Good. 
Okay, and you know, this is about it. You know, this is, um, essentially this concludes the class. Uh, just, uh, you know, let's go through a summary of the class and you know, if you have any questions, you know, we can take, some, we have some time, I can take any questions about anything in the class. Okay, so first thing that we did is we looked at models of physical systems. Why did we do that? Because in order to design a controller, what we want to have is we need a mathematical model that describes how a certain system will behave. Okay? Otherwise, you know, there is little that I can do engineering-wise, right? Or at least little I can do in terms of systematic sound engineering. Okay? So in particular, what we talk about is state, state space models, because you know something that is kind of like easy to write, you know, gives us a lot of insight and you know, uh, uh, fairly useful. Uh, we looked at nonlinear systems, equilibria, how you linearize nonlinear systems, okay? And so given then, you know, the model is essentially a bunch of equations, right? So a bunch of formulas that tell me how the, the derivative of the system uh, moves, uh, you know, given, for example, the state and the input, okay? So then we computed the response in the time domain. We wrote some formulas, and you know, these are some integrals that we can compute and compute what the time response of a system will be. But writing down those formulas allowed us to understand under what conditions on the A matrix the system will be stable or unstable, right? You remember? What we had is that when you compute the response in the time domain, what you have is a bunch of exponentials, e to the power a t. Right? What are the conditions on the matrix A in such a way that these exponentials are actually decaying to zero? What you need is the eigenvalues of the matrix A need to be, have a real part that is negative, okay? Essentially that allows us to, to discern systems that are stable versus systems that are unstable just by looking at the state space model, in particular just by looking at the A matrix. Good. Um, so then what we looked at is, okay, so what if you take one of the systems and put it in a feedback loop with, for example, just a simple um, proportional controller, just a simple game, okay? And the way we do that is we looked at how the, um, how the poles change when you do this feedback interconnection. In particular, we looked at the root locus, right? As a way to understand what happens to the closed loop I mean, what happens when I close the loop around the system with a proportional gain, okay? For other methods, we started looking at, you know, another way of writing the model of dynamical system that is, in a sense, is equivalent because it contains exactly the same information, okay? And that's the transfer functions, okay? So essentially what we did is we defined transfer function as in the following way. We know that for a linear system that is stable, if I apply an input, which is uh, an exponential, has this one of those exponential forms, e to the power st, in particular, it could be a sinusoid. What we get is the same exponential, but with a different magnitude and different phase. Okay? The complex number that tells me what is the magnitude and the phase of the response with respect to the input is what we call the transfer function. Okay, the transfer function when S is chosen to be J omega, that is when the input is chosen to be sinusoid, that's called the frequency response, okay? Now, writing your model in terms of transfer function as opposed to a safe space model is very useful because it makes interconnections very easy. You just multiply transfer functions. And also allow us to use, you know, uh, tools like the Nyquist, uh, the Nyquist plot, uh, body plots, um, uh, well, I mean, these are the tools that we used, okay? Um, good. And then we said, okay, so essentially now we know how to, you know, under what conditions the feedback is stable. Now what we said is that, you know, very often stability is not the only thing that we want. Well, what we want is also, for example, that the ability to reject noise, to reject disturbances, to track the reference with a small error or potentially with zero error, right? Or we want the response to be fast enough or we want to be able to track commands up to a certain frequency, right? 
So these are what we call the specifications. And then we essentially look at ways that you can design your control system in such a way that your closed loop is not only stable, but also matches all of your specifications. Okay? You know, up to this point, that really, you know, all the theory. Then we looked at how, you know, what happens when there are some things that deviate from the theory. In particular, we looked at things like what happens when you have time delays because one source of time delays is actually your microcontroller, you know, your digital computer computing the, implementing the controller, okay? We looked at nonlinearities and this anti-wind up, you know, what happens when you have separation and an integrator and you know, things like that. And then today we looked at robustness and how you actually implement these controllers, okay? So I hope this gives you a nice picture of how you do uh, control design for single input, single output, linear, time invariant systems, okay? Now, what you will encounter is in your career is that um, not, all of, not all the control systems that you had to design are single input, single output, linear, time invariant. However, um, and you will see that there are more advanced techniques that allow you to design control, control systems. On the other hand, what I think you should get out of this class is this um, I know it may not be there yet, but this ability to have this intuitive feeling of how a controller should work, how it should behave, how it should be designed, okay? That's why I emphasize a lot in this class graphical, kind of graphical methods over algebraic methods, okay? Yes, you can do, do all the algebra, will take you three days, and you will make mistakes, or you can do a quick drawing. Okay, and the kind of intuition that you get from the quick picture is actually typically better than the intuition that, oh, it's hard to get intuition from a lot of algebra, right? <laughs> but, uh, so it's, it's actually more intuitive than just doing all the algebra and making mistakes along the way, okay? And I think that's actually something that is important even for you as you study and learn more advanced techniques, because a lot of the techniques that you will study are very much like black boxes. Okay, so you go into MATLAB, type a command in MATLAB, boom, you have your optimal controller. Do you believe that? I don't know, maybe you made a mistake along the way. Um, and you know, for me, this is important in everything you do with a computer, everything that you do with a black box system, you should know what to expect as an answer before you type it or not, okay? And what you learn in this class helps you achieving exactly that, okay? So don't be fooled by MATLAB or Mathematic or whatever that gives you some result that you do not understand. You want to know in advance what it should look like, okay? And you want to understand what are the effects of some of the parameter changes that you may make in your control design, even using these more advanced techniques, okay? Now, talking about the more advanced techniques, uh, what are other courses that are offered in this department on control systems? Um, so, well, first of all, there is a, there is a, a, like a laboratory course in which you are exposed to a number of, you know, control experiments. Um, you know, is that offered in general, right? You, you know when that is offered? Uh-huh. Okay. And there's actually September. Just September. Um, there's, there's a very small course called. Um, that's embedded control. Yeah, so, so that's, uh, that's it's yet another thing, so right? It's very, very <laughs> right. So it's uh, one, one of these short, like, block courses, right? How, what are they called? Uh, like, like, one week, two weeks, very intensive, right? But, um, uh, anyway, so, so this is something that you may want to do. This is just a laboratory practice, you know, just do more practice, um, you know, with real systems so that you get to see, you know, what, what these old systems are. Control systems too. Um, so control systems too is kind of like a follow-up to this class. Um, I will not be teaching it. Um, um, Jacopo Tani, one of my, you know, other assistants will, uh, will teach it. 
And essentially, control systems two is taking the next step from this class, moving to essentially multiple input, multiple output systems. And you will see that when you work with multiple input, multiple output systems, it's much easier to work in the state space. And uh, you will actually do a lot of linear algebra and work with what are called like a modern methods for control design that are really based on, yeah, as I said, yeah, a lot of linear algebra, uh, a lot of things that you do in MATLAB, and a lot of black boxes. So that's why I keep, don't forget what you did in this class, okay? Uh, other courses are optimal control. So what we did in this class was really about, you know, specifications and looking at the, the shape of the response and things like that. Sometimes what you want to do is, for example, design your control system in such a way that you reach an objective in minimum time, right? Or maybe with minimum fuel or minimum energy or something like that, okay? Uh, and that, you know, something that teaches you how to do that. Um, courses on stochastic systems, stochastic control, very often what you have is a, you know, is a disturbance that enters the system or maybe your system dynamics are not deterministic, they are stochastic, okay? Some random components. So then how do you control a system that has this random uh, behavior? System modeling was a course that was offered this semester. Uh, maybe many of you, or a few of you have taken it. And this is a course that really teaches you how to write those state space equations in a sense, okay? So for us was just, we did it in one lecture. That course is a full semester of how you write down models of dynamic systems. Uh, recursive estimation uh, is about essentially how you estimate the state of your system based on the measurements of the output, right? So for example, uh, in a car, you may measure, you know, how, how much the wheels have turned, the heading or acceleration, and you want to estimate where the car is or something like that, right? So, you know, these are all things that are covered in recursive estimation. Uh, there are also classes in model predictive control. Model predictive control is actually something that, you know, one of you asked the question, one of the lectures, in which, you know, how do you do feedback control is something, well, I can try to model, if I did this and this and this, if I apply these control inputs, this is, I think, what will happen to my system, okay? And then I design my sequence of future inputs in such a way that the future behavior of the system is something that I like, okay? And this is exactly model predictive control. So essentially what you do is at every time step, you try to optimize over a certain time horizon how your system will behave in the future. And then you pick the control value based on that, okay? And then you keep doing that, okay? Uh, this is a very popular technique. Uh, actually, some of the um, really world-leading um, uh, researchers in this field are actually here at the at the heart. So, I mean, this is a very well-established, um, you know, school uh, here, uh, here in Zurich. Okay. So, fine. Uh, well, at this point, I uh, will stop here. Uh, Thank you for your attention, for your patience you know, during the during the during the course, and uh, well, best wishes for Merry Christmas and the Happy New Year.